So our vision, um, this has been our vision over the last few years, which we communicated, communicated to the enterprise. And it is that apps is not everything there's to it. Um, you also need analytics to know what is going on. Um, it has been the same for websites. You need to know how your users are using your app and able to um, improve on them, to iterate on them, to come up with new updates that uh, make sure that your users stay engaged and that they maybe sell whatever you're selling or that they keep using your product. product. Uh, so you need analytics for that. Um, you also need analytics on what ha what's happening internally. So how is your app performing? How, is the, how are the calls performing to the APIs that you use? And then the third component are the APIs themselves. Probably you're using some of the public APIs, like maybe you have social integration in your app or you're using an existing backend uh, or Salesforce or MongoDB or MySQL and you need to expose those APIs um, to your apps. And then when building your apps, like Jürgen already mentioned, you need to test it constantly. So those three fields are the three areas that um, Accelerator is concerned about. And when it comes to the community offering, until now we only got you about half of it. So you could build your app, but there were no automated testing builds. There were some community analytics, but the dashboard wasn't that um, clear as we had for the enterprise, and we did not have any information about how your API calls performed. And then we had APIs. Um, you could use uh, some out-of-the-box out APIs from our ACS product, and you could even build custom ones using Node ACS. Um, but we did not have the connectors for Salesforce that we offered for enterprise. Please go ahead. Um, for the enterprise, there was MySQL APIs, um, but for the community, there was not. Yeah. So what we're doing now is we're opening up all of the packets for the community. So you will be able to use all of these three components for your apps. Um, this vision has been embraced by um, researchers um, like Gardner, who um, said that uh, Accelerator was not only big in vision, but also in execution making us a leader in um, the quadrant for mobile application development platforms. Um, but um, of course, we're interested in what it does for the end user. And Forza did a user, uh, a re user research for Accelerator um, enterprise users and found that it saved them about 40% um, in time to market and about 75% in time to resolution. So like Jurgen explained, if you invest in a good test automation platform, it saves you time even after a few iterations because you have so many, so less uh, little time to spend on keeping your test automation up to date to do all the manual testing. You can just press a button and tests are done. But what I personally find most, um, uh, what I like seeing best is, is these kind of numbers, that there are 300 million devices out there running an, an accelerator app. So people won't, if, hopefully p people won't notice. I mean, I notice when I, I use uh, perhaps like a phone gap app, I use, uh, I notice when I interact with the app. But of course it's our goal that users don't notice that it's an accelerator app. Um, but there are 300 million devices out there that run at least one accelerator app. We have solution partners that we work with and over 700,000 registered developers in 185 countries and 2 billion cloud API calls per month. And that number is already surpassed. Uh, we have a way higher number at the moment. Um, so that's API calls for push notifications, for device registrations, for ACS, for node ACS, and for analytics. So there's a lot of stuff already going on in the platform. And then there's 400, uh, more than 400 modules and widgets that you can get through the marketplace and a lot more on GitHub um, in open source repositories. So there's a large user base. And for me, this tells best that we are on the right path with our, pro with our products because if it wasn't for these 700,000 developers, um, for sure they are very picky in what they use. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that you as a developer are very picky in what platform you want to use it's of course you are restricted by the technology that you already know 
um, but there's plenty to choose from. So if you select Accelerator as your solution, it says a lot to us. So that's our vision behind our product. Any questions on that before we continue to walk through the solution? Okay. So the, like I said, in the triangle with APIs, apps, and um, a APIs, apps, and analytics, um, not all the tools were available for the community. So we had Titanium Studio, you could build apps using Titanium, and then we had some ACS services and Node ACS to build custom Node um, API middleware. Um, but for the enterprise, we had a lot more. We had an Insights um, iPad and Android tablet app, an advanced accelerated dashboard to see all your analytics, but also your performance analytics, send push notifications. And we had a lot more integration with backend data sources like MySQL, Salesforce, um, and all of this automated and available through APIs so you could integrate it into your business process. So this is what we are now opening up to everyone. So let's zoom into one of those, or a few of those solutions. So first of all, if you have been working with push notifications from the community solution or ACS, you've been working at my.accelerator.com, which has uh, a limited interface in to the analytics and allows you to send push notifications. All this is now integrated in platform.accelerator.com, which has, right from the start, gives you an overview of how all of your apps are doing worldwide, information about sessions, all of the most important analytics that's out there. And it gives you access via a unified navigation to all of the different components of the platform. So from one website, you can do you can view your analytics, you can send push notifications, you can manage your data on ACS, which is now called ROdB. You can manage your testing. Um, you can watch um, the new and accelerated university videos to learn more about the platform. You can access the new Q&A documentation. Everything is there. It's a one-stop shop. And here you can see a screenshot of the um, previous edition of the community platform dashboard. So Studio, um, who of you are, have been using Titanium Studio so far? That's most of you. Okay. And who of you already work with Accelerate the Studio? What do you like more? <laughs> So we're discontinuing Titanium Studio um, to focus fully on one studio version that will be available to everyone. Um, so you get all the features that until now was restricted for enterprise users only, which include um, Live View, um, which saves you a lot of time. You can just code and as soon as you save um, the instance that you have running on a simulator or multiple devices, updates immediately without needing to compile the whole Xcode project again. So you can just, of course, this is fast forward, <coughs> but it really is a fraction of a second and it's there. So that saves you a lot of time. Um, yeah. So other uh, features that you can now use is a profiler. Um, you can run your app, start the profiler, do some interactions, and you can see exactly how much time is spent in each of the functions that is executed. Um, this is a very good reason to not use anonymous functions anymore, even in callbacks, because um, it will not give you much feedback if you do. So please use named functions, and you know exactly what function is taking mo more time. So you probably need to look at if you can make that function more efficient, or maybe split it up. Uh, and use defer to at least um, give the user some time to do interactions with the UI again. Um, what, you can, what is also integrated in Studio is the code analyzer. You run it on a project and it gives you information about if you use deprecated APIs or other stuff that you should not be doing. So it, it just gives you a one click report on the quality of your code. So it's a very easy tool to use um, to improve your project. And the third thing integrated is testing, which is enterprise only, which is basically a um, distribution of SOSTA, which allows you to do touch interaction tests, record them on one device and play them on a whole bunch of devices. And you can run them over and over again each time you make changes to your code. Sorry? It's enterprise only. 
Yeah, so it's not in the in the free, it's definitely not in the free version. No, sorry. It's the expensive tool for us as well. <laughs> so any more questions on Studio? The enterprise version is still a custom price because it's all custom. The other plans, um, which we'll uh, walk through in the end, all have set limits on API uses and push notifications that you can send and the features that you use and don't use. Enterprise is really just an account manager of us who sits down with you and looks exactly at what you need and we make you a price for that. So there's no fixed price on that. But it's, it's pretty much what it was. It's, still, it's very costly. More costly than the. What's the sorry? What's the, what, what's the amount, uh, amount for? You want to give away some amounts that you. Uh, <laughs> we paid six thousand dollars per year. Mm -hmm. Before it was free. Per seat. Per what? Per seat. Yeah. yeah. So that's about double yeah. of the team seat. <laughs> Depends on what you get. <laughs> okay. So for those, uh, any of you who are not using Studio would have been using CLI. Okay. Good. So you're very faithful Studio users, which is good. But there's also CLI. And in fact, the Studio is powered by the CLI. So every time you do something in Studio, um, you'll see in a console um, that it's just executing the CLI, um, which makes that you could also use Sublime or Atom or any editor of your choice and then use the CLI um, to build the projects, to create projects, to um, create arrow projects, connect, add new connectors, whatever you want. Everything you do in Studio basically is possible in CLI as well. Um, there are some changes to the CLI. We now have one integrated CLI. We used to have titanium CLI, alloy CLI, and an ACS CLI. And now it's one CLI. Um, <clears throat> the most important change of this CLI is until now, um, for example, if you were, had an app that was still in, um, in a 2.x version of the SDK, you needed to use uh, a 2.x version of the CLI as well just to run that SDK. So if you needed to switch back to a project that you um, use the most recent version, like 3.5.1 on, you need to install or upgrade the CLI to be able to use that SDK. And then when you switch back to the other project, you need to install that older version of the CLI again. Now, the accelerator um, CLI, um, you can have multiple versions installed and they all come bundled with the, um, with the correct alloy, ACS, and titanium CLI version in it. So you just can switch between different FC versions using FC use and you get the correct alloy and titanium and ACS version. So no more uh, troubles switching back and forth to older versions. Of course, this only works from now on. So the oldest version you can switch to is 4.0. <laughs> um, and you can still run the original CLIs, the bundled CLIs using FC TI, FC ACS, and FC alloy. Um, but for now, mostly you will use FC new to create a new project and it will ask you if you want to create an arrow project or a titanium project or uh, a module to extend the titanium SDK. And you will run FC run to build the titanium project or the arrow project. So it's a more integrated um, experience now. So question, is it still depending on the uh, internet connection so you can't run unless you have connection to the arrow? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It, uh, maybe two important remarks is the, if you have titanium CLI and ACS and alloy installed globally, um, those are totally independent of the accelerator CLI. The accelerator CLI doesn't use the global installed titanium CLI, it uses a uh, local version of the titanium CLI. So you can still have the old versions installed and the titanium CLI will, will be updated and the yellow version will be updated uh, as part of the open source project and you can continue to use that and when you're using the FC CLI, you're using the local version that are bundled for that particular FC version. Um, and the titanium CLI will not um, require you to log in, and the FC uh, version does require you to log in. Yeah. 
So um, titanium, who of you is new to titanium? I heard one or two questions about what is titanium exactly. Um, okay, so um, to at a very high level to give an overview of what titanium is in just one slide, you'll use JavaScript, which is a very common language, um, which is um, if you have ever looked at uh, Objective-C, um, you will appreciate JavaScript. Um, so it's one language and you can code your apps in, in just this language. And with the new um, platform, you can even use uh, JavaScript to code your middleware APIs. Um, and even most of our tooling is written in JavaScript. All of the accelerated CLIs, it's all JavaScript. Um, so we, we love JavaScript. Um, and this JavaScript that runs in your um, app talks to an, um, a bridge layer that sits in between the JavaScript engine and the native code. And what is very important to point out is that um, the UI that you see is a native UI. It's not like uh, solutions like PhoneGap uh, or some solutions that IBM have and others like Sencha, that the UI is an HTML website. It's not a full screen web browser with an HTML interface. It really is a native UI. If you do a TIUI create button, it creates a native button on Android and a native UI button on iOS. So the bridge, um, every time you call, do a call on the TIUI namespace, you're talking to a native component there. If you're doing an HTTP request, it's a native HTTP request handler that is used. It's no, um, it's no JavaScript version of it. So in the end, you will be able to, um, to build an iOS version, Android version, a Windows version. We also have BlackBerry and Tizen still at the moment. Um, so you have one code base with one lang language and you're able to run all of these apps. Does this mean that you can write once and then build for all of these platforms? No. The average Titanium app has about 90, if you, if you have a very simple interface, maybe like 90, 95% code reuse. Because it's a single code base, you don't have to copy paste the code that you shared between these platforms. You can have it at one place. But in your code, you will have um, some branching, like if iOS um, do this, if Android do this. And for the logic part, you won't see that. But for the UI, you will. Because it doesn't make much sense to, do, um, to use a navigation window on, iOS, on Android, because it's, it's not available. And since you're creating UI or native UI components, um, you need to account for these differences. And for some, we, like you have a tab group on iOS and you have a tab group on Android, but it looks very different and it's different components. On iOS, it's on the bottom and on Android, it's integrated in the action bar. But um, so for those, you can use one API and it will work on both. But for components that are truly different, we don't, provide a cross-platform API. We, um, we uh, allow you to do both of them in JavaScript, but you still have to do it for Android and iOS specific because we, we like to think that um, having an, uh, a, um, a cross-platform framework in the, in the sense that you, you code it once and you have exactly the same UI across all of these platforms is not, is not true cross-platform. Um, true cross-platform frameworks should be um, easy to use from one language, from one code base, but it should be very specific to each of the platforms. For an Android user, you should provide an Android experience and not some kind of surrogate iOS experience. So that's an important thing to point out. Yeah, and if you, I, I mean, all the source code for Titanium is open source, so if you dig into it, um, you basically see the work you would have to do yourself if you would do it in Objective-C and Java, which is now done by the accelerator engineers. And sometimes some of the bugs that people run into with Titanium are um, when you look into the source code, you're like, wow, what a, what a huge um, piece of code just for this simple alert. But we have to account for, like, it's still working on iOS 5, and then there's this strange bug on iPad where we have to do something else and then for iOS 6 it works differently again. Well, of course you, as if you have done it in object to see yourself, you can easily say, oh, I only support 8 and up. But we cannot 
uh, we cannot decide that for our users. So we have to, we try to account for all of these versions and all of these differences and all of these, um, uh, all of these things that you no longer have to worry about. Yeah, the overhead is in the, in the bridge layer. So the, um, the JavaScript engine is very fast. Um, so the calculation that you do there, um, that, that's minimal. Um, but every time you do a call to the TI UI or TI namespace, uh, you, you cross the bridge like you do here in Denmark and Sweden. So that's, that's, uh, that has its toll. Um, so you want to be very um, efficient in doing that. For example, um, if you're using our Alloy MVC framework, which we'll get to in, in a bit, um, you're, you will use uh, OS, iOS directives in your code, and those will be replaced when you package your Titanium app, and your Titanium app will have no Android-specific code anymore. And this, this means that and when normally you would have like if ti.platform.name is Android, that code is not there anymore. But if, even if you were programming in Classic without Alloy, it would make sense to not do TI platform Android every time, but just have a local variable where you want for once read out that value and then use it from then on. Same for events. If you have events um, that only are relevant inside the JavaScript engine, why some people use ti.app.fire event to fire an event, but that crosses the bridge and then back again. And, but it, it's, never, it's not relevant on the native side. You only need it on the JavaScript side. So why not just use a, a local dispatcher in JavaScript that manages there? So there's a lot of these optimizations that you can do to make sure that you cross the bridge as, um, uh, as less as you can. And, and we also make sure that we have with that we make very efficient use of this bridge as well. For example, we introduced list, uh, list view as a successor of table view, which is still available. Um, where, and where table view, you had to create all of the views that make part of all the cells in your table yourself, and then you put them in this table view. With list view, you just, um, you come up with a template in, uh, as a, and a JavaScript object. You pass that along to the native side, and then you pass all the data that has to be, that, that populates this list view. So you only cross the bridge twice, where normally you would cross it maybe a hundred or a thousand times. So we try to provide this kind of mechanism to minimize the, um, the toll that the bridge has. Now for Windows, we're using a new bridge layer, which is called Hyperloop Abstraction Layer, HAL, and which is using a, a technical complex, but just in short, way more efficient process um, where we don't have this bridge bottleneck anymore. Uh, and this uh, layer will also be used on iOS and Android. So th th this is the only overhead that you, that you will get from uh, Titanium. Now, if you would do a benchmark with some very heavy computation, you will see a difference. In a normal everyday app, you will not see any difference in my experience. I don't know how it's for you in yeah, the problem is with Titanium, if you fuck up in JavaScript and you mess up with the garbage collection there, you have a polluted garbage uh, JavaScript uh, environment, but all of these JavaScript objects also have bindings with the native side, so it's a mess there as well. So that's something to be, you have to be a good JavaScript programmer, and I, I often talk to people who come from a web development background who think they know JavaScript if they can copy-paste JavaScript uh, snippets and jQuery plugins. And I always tell people, get a book, learn how to really write JavaScript, because in a web browser, I mean, even if you have 30 errors in your console, if the page is there, you're fine. And on the next, pa next page request, and, uh, I mean, it's not, a, uh, it's not a round. But in Titanium, JavaScript is there forever until the user closes the app uh, or even force quits the app, and most users don't even know how to do that. So if you have a memory leak or an error there, it will crash your app or in time <coughs> make it slower and then finally crash your app. So you have to write JavaScript properly. So Titanium... Um, as you get it with the platform, um, you will get certified fully tested releases. So we test all of the code. We have a lot of automation there. Um, we also have some new security features built in. So you can prevent the use of app debugging. So if a user has a, 
a device, maybe a rooted device with some debugging tools so that you can peek into your code. We can block it. And we also can prevent the use of rooted device overall, um, which you might not want because it's about 20% of the uses, but you can do so. For enterprise uses, it's a very uh, desired feature because they want to just rule that out. And you get some additional modules like SQLite with database encryption, uh, geofencing, um, HTTPS with SSL pinning. So this is our, you can see by the list, these are modules that our enterprise users wanted, but now it's available for team and enterprise plans as well. Yeah. Um, now for the open source part, it's still there. So if you um, go to accelerator.org, you see our open source website. And the Titanium CLI, you can still install it from NPM. We'll still keep it up to date. We still use it internally. It's, it's bundled in the FC CLI. We still do nightly builds for the Titanium SDK, um, but no more certified releases. So if you want to have a certified tested release, you need to um, be a registered developer for the platform. Um, you can do your own builds, uh, pick the exact commit that you want, do your own build. It's all documented how you do that. And we get nightly builds for you. Um, but for a tested release, you need to be a registered developer. And you can develop and publish apps just like you used to. So no changes there apart from the nightly builds. Um, like I said, Titanium Studio will not be continued, so you'll not be able to log into the studio anymore uh, or use it. We won't update it anymore. But that's not, but it's not active yet, so you should still be able to log in at the moment. And the source code is still there on GitHub. There's no accelerator fork or anything. We use exactly the same SDK, just add in these extra uh, modules on top of it. And you can still send in PRs. Well, the difference is, is um, that we've tested it and that if you come to us with the support questions and we ask you what version do you use, I use 3.1, 5.1.ga, then we support you. If you come with, oh, I use this custom build with this and this from, di sorry. I mean, we haven't tested it, so we don't know what you've done to it or, um, so that's, it's certified, we, cert we guarantee it will work. And if it doesn't work, it's our problem. Well, you will know that it has passes all of our automated testing because otherwise it wouldn't have been a build, but not the manual QA testing. So the other major open source project we have is Alloy. Who of you is using Alloy at the moment? So half of you. So uh, for the rest of you, please use Alloy. <laughs> Not for my sake, but for your sake. <laughs> it will make your life easier a lot. I will explain in a moment a bit what Alloy is. Um, but the same is true for Alloy. You can still get it on NPM. Um, it still plugs into the Titanium CLI, so if your project uses Alloy, it will run Alloy before it will run Titanium. Um, it's still there on GitHub. We don't have a separate version of it. We use exactly the same version, and you can still uh, contribute to it. Now, what is Alloy? This is what you do in Classic. Um, you have markup, styling, logic. It's all there. Um, this is a very simple one. So here I can tell that the label is in the window, but if you have a complex view, there is no way I can tell you how that view is constructed. I mean, you really have to, the, the label is added to a view, to a, a wrapper view and a wrapper view is added to a header view and this is added to a padding left view and whatever. There's no way I can tell what does this view like. I have to run the app and then still I don't know, I know what I get, but I don't know how it is constructed. So with Alloy, you will write your markup in XML. So I immediately know this is a window with a label in it. Um, you can bind to event, hand, uh, event listeners like um, you do in HTML. You just have the event listener in your JavaScript. And you can have your styling in separate TSS files, which is similar to CSS, but a subset of it. So it's, it's a, a little bit more limited. So this means you can have your designer find you the, the design, um, set the padding, the colors, and stuff like that, and just tell him to not touch any of the JavaScript. Right now, you will probably run into your designer adding white, but then accidentally making a change here and there. So with Alloy, you can just tell him only the, the TSS. And um, for the XML, what I often do is just kind of mock up my application using just um, the XML views and 
using the logic to just open that view and then from that click I open that view. So I can only run through my app without having it styled or fully um, finished the logic yet. So this is what Alloy does. It's, it's a typical MVC framework, but it's not so typical in the way that when you run your app on your um, simulator or device, there's not so much of Alloy there anymore. Because before, when you build a Titanium project, first it will do, it, it will compile Alloy to a classic project. So for Alloy, you will work in an app folder, uh, where in classic you were used to work in a resources folder. But if you look in a project, and when you have it open in Studio, you will, by default, it hides um, the resources folder. But if you go to Finder, you will see it still has a resources folder and every time you make a change and compile your app it will generate the whole resources folder for you and it's a classic project there's some stuff in it there's some backbone some underscore some I mean some best practices that we basically now force um, but there's no XML there there's no TSS there it's all JavaScript so again as it, um, um, when we speak about overhead alloy has no overhead at all. The only overhead is when you compile your app. So you have to wait for Alloy to compile before it can compile Titanium. Um, so for Live View, you have to wait for Alloy to compile and then you skip the Titanium compile session. Um, but on runtime, there's no overhead at all. Probably your apps will just be faster because we um, enforce a lot of best practices and we also run some automatic code optimizations. And like I already said, we strip out any code that is targeted for, the, for a different platform than the platform that you're building your app for. So if you have this if iOS, if Android, and you can do that in XML and TSS and JavaScript, um, the code for Android will not end up in your iOS app. Arrow. Um, ArrowDB is what you now know as ACS which is um, cloud storage for objects of different sorts. Um, typical sorts that you see in apps like places, users, check-ins, chat messages, um, and about it's about 20 pre-built services that you can use out of the box. There's uh, SDKs for it, there's a REST API for it, and you can just uh, drop it in your app and use it straight away. No configuration, nothing. You can build Facebook um, without even building a backend. Um, what is also part of DB is sending push notifications. Um, you can now do that from the same platform as well. So you can manage your ACS data and you can send push notifications to all of the platforms and different devices. Set different constraints like the radius from a, a specific point, channels, etc. And do it all from there. So you used to do it from my.accelerator.com and now you will do this from the new platform. Um, so ArrowDB is what it uh, until now was ACS and who of you is also using Node ACS? None. Okay, Node ACS is our Node.js server um, which allows you to deploy any standard Node.js application we already did have some kind of framework that you could plug into so you don't have to write all of the express uh, bootstrapping. You could just have routes and controllers and views. Um, and it allowed you to run basically any Node.js powered website. So you could pull in uh, express or some other MVC and then run a, a full website on that server. But it was mainly aimed at building custom middleware because we also had the ACS API, API is there, so you could hook into ACS objects that were already there, like users, posts, photos, and then perhaps talk to this Node.js backend from your app so that when a user uploads a new photo, it would also send that photo to, um, to Instagram or um, maybe recognize a face and do some processing with that. So any custom API, um, that you needed on top of ACS, you could build it in Node ACS. This product now is called Arrow Cloud and it comes with a new MVC framework so you can very easily just define a route, define a controller, use a view and that can be a markdown view or handlebar and we have about four or five different renderers available and you can 
build a website like University. University is an Aero Cloud app. It runs fully on Aero Cloud. And all of the data in the university, all of the videos and stuff, the meta, meta information about that is all stored in AeroDB. So your Aero Cloud instance talks to AeroDB and your phone can talk to AeroDB directly or via custom middleware that you build in Aero Cloud, which is exactly what the, the Accelerator University app for Android and iOS do as well. They talk to the same APIs that the website uses. And then the new product in this family is Arrow Builder. It is part of Arrow Cloud and it's a um, framework much like Alloy um, is for Titanium. It allows you to make um, new APIs that you would normally code manually for Arrow Cloud or um, uh, formally in Node ACS, but then use a visual UI, um, visual builder to compose those models. You can easily select different data sources. We have connectors for a lot of data sources out there. So no longer like on those ACS, you had to pull in existing node libraries for MySQL or Postgres or wherever, and then initialize those and configure those and then hook them up to API endpoints and do a lot of these custom logic. In Arrow Builder, you can just select, okay, I want to install the Salesforce connector. You get all of the Salesforce tables. Okay, you select, I want to create a new model which pulls in that field from that table on Salesforce, but then maybe also another field from a MySQL database that I have, and you can join those together. So you can join different data sources. Um, so not just different tables from the same source, but also different tables from different sources. So you could have, you could pull in um, like an ArrowDB user object and then extend that with information that you have in Salesforce. So you combine all of the different backend uh, systems that you now interact with directly from your app and do that in Aero Builder, which you can publish to Aero Cloud. So with this, we hope to do what Alloy did for Titanium, namely less coding and more benefits. So you can use this, GUI, this um, UI builder to build this model publish it to Aero Cloud, and then use it with your app. What about logic that you put in the, in the back? I mean, if you, if you create something here, and you, you implement some node logic in the back end, for instance, with that data, um, and then you need to um, enhance this API with maybe a third source. So that's go, you know, can you do that without actually destroying some of the logic? Yeah, the builder generates um, JavaScript models, so you can you can adapt those models yourself. Um, you can add before and after uh, code, so you can do some uh, code before the model, um, some code on the the parameters that you pass to the API, and then some um, you can add some other other logic that you apply to the data as it comes out of the model and before it goes out to the user or to the um, to the app. Um, you could also build, um, apart from the, the, the APIs that Builder, the, the Arrow Builder generates, you can also build your own um, API endpoints using the same logic and also set the exact action. So that action can be anything, much like the controller for Alloy. So you don't have to build the whole uh, bootstrapping for uh, like uh, you don't have to bother about if that user wants XML in return or CSV or JSON or um, translating the uh, the payload of his API call to to and to parse that and to do whatever you need to do it. You you get all that of from Arrow, and you only have to write the very logic to take those parameters and whatever the user sends to the API, and then return the data. And then Arrow again takes care of how that has to come back to the user uh, in XML or in JSON or whatever format. So um, by default, Aero Builder would generate a model that has uh, uh, no before code, no after code, and an action that just pulls in a model. But you can, do, you can modify any of that code. But it, after you've modified the code, you cannot use Aero Builder on that specific uh, model again, because it would just override um, uh, that data. Um, but from the builder itself, you can already combine different data sources. So you can, you can first create a model 
or it will even auto-generate models for all of the tables in your MySQL database, in your Salesforce database, and you can then create a composite model that uses some data from Salesforce, some data for SQL, some data from AeroDB, and return all that in one model. So that's, that's what you normally had to do yourself when you build a middleware API. And those even, they, they don't um, necessarily need to be related. So most of the times you would do some kind of join condition. So you have a user from AeroDB, which has a custom field, which is the Salesforce ID, so you join on that. But they can also be totally um, unrelated. So there are normally you would do in your app maybe like four or five ABI API calls like fetch uh, some Twitter stream, fetch a list of um, headlines from your uh, website, and then fetch some data from a MySQL data source, which are totally unrelated. You can now make one composite model, fetch all the data and return it into once, and it will just have one property for each of these sources. So that will save your app um, three API calls, and j it just has to do one API call. So there's much to say about Arrow, and, and Jurgen already um, shared with me that there will be an Arrow-specific uh, meetup event about Arrow to really dive into everything Arrow can do. I do have a very short movie to show some of these Arrow builder, where it will create a model, and then you see it generates the code. And then the good thing about Arrow is that you, when you run Arrow locally, um, you get documentation, you get interactive documentation, so you write from the documentation, you can do all of the API calls. Um, you also get all of the logs, so it, you, it tells you exactly how much time is spent in requesting the data from the backend, in processing it, and returning it to the user. Um, and when you publish this server to online, um, by default, the administration part of Arrow will be disabled, um, but the API documentation um, can st is by default still enabled. So you don't have to write any documentation. Everything you see here, including the ability to automatically execute that API, is all there available online. Um, as I said, we have some built-in connectors that you can use with Arrow. So you connect, connect to Box, to Salesforce, to JWA Player, to MySQL. Um, and there's lots of new connectors added. And this all lives at our new marketplace, which is software.accelerator.com, which again is an Arrow app. So also our own marketplace is built on Arrow uh, Cloud.